What's up everybody? This is Professor Keegan and I'm here with another video for our Tuesday night lecture, um, uh, LGBTQ identities class. We have a about like what three weeks left now? Holy crap. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start off with some reminders um, as I usually do. And that is to say, this is a short list of reminders, but really I'm just going to direct you to a whole other list of reminders that I sent to you earlier this week because um, I've drawn up a three-week final plan that I emailed you all yesterday morning. Um, I also posted this on Blackboard under announcements, uh, and it is my master plan for getting us through the material in the course and making sure, hopefully, that everyone can complete this course successfully. Um, so if you haven't yet reviewed that list, I would ask you to please check out either Blackboard or your uh, GVSU email. Um, and make sure that you're taking notes and have a good idea of how we're going to proceed. Um, if anything there is confusing, you need to reach out to me on Slack or via email and let me know so that I can clarify the plan, the three-week master plan. Um, okay, so please do that for me. And the other thing I'm going to ask you to do is that if I have reached out to you via email in the past few days, um, it's likely because you have an incomplete assignment or something hanging um, that needs resolution in Blackboard. So um, especially if I reached out to you about your keywords and concepts checklist, um, we really do need to get that material finished and submitted because that is going to be counting for quite a bit of your grade. Um, so please reach out to me uh, in response to my email so that we can work on a plan for getting that work submitted in a timely manner. Um, and that really will be key to being able to complete the course and um, you know move into summer. So that's really all I have in terms of reminders for today. So please do that kind of um, work with uh, my announcements. And um, I'm gonna move forward into what is going to be, I think a little different lecture um, because we've been focusing so much on um, content uh, in this class and less on form. And um, this week and the week earlier when we looked at ED Fake's work, I wanted to, you to be thinking a bit about the kinds of ways in which LGBTQ people tell stories. So we talked about um, how illustration and comics and fine art and painting might be a way to kind of approach in more experimental ways telling stories about identities that are non-normative. So we looked at Fake's work, um, Gaylord Phoenix, as one way to kind of get into a more kind of uncharted, unfamiliar kind of storytelling. And we are in Unit 5, um, Stories, right? And today I had you look at uh, a little piece of memoir by Ricky Ann Wilkins. Um, but I also had you look at Natalie Win Wynn's uh, YouTube channel, ContraPoints, and I had you look at her video, Beauty. Um, and today I want to kind of slow down and get you thinking more about the medium of what we call the vlog, um, which is what ContraPoints is. It's a vlogging channel, right? And um, ContraPoints herself, Natalie Wynn's character, is a vlogging character. Um, and I want to give you some tips and, and kind of um, structure for thinking about the kinds of storytelling platforms that have developed in new media spaces and then how LGBTQ people, I think trans people specifically in this, in this week of content, are utilizing new media formats to tell new kinds of stories about their experiences. Um, so I wanted you to look at and think about um, this, this uh, piece, Beauty, uh, because it really is engaging in a lot of uh, resistance to the dominant ways in which trans identities are represented and narrated in, in um, US culture. Um, so this is Natalie Wynn, and let's get into some discussion of what vlogging is and how trans creators are using it to tell new kinds of stories about their experiences. So vlogging, it, which is short for video blogging, is actually a form of diaristic video practice, um, like uh, kind of like a diary as a way of like narrating your own life story, right, to, to an imaginary audience. Um, so in this case, there's a real audience um, and vloggers are filming themselves, right? So they're taking on the role of creating the image as well as making the image. And I think that's something really important to notice. Remember when we talked uh, about the medical gaze and how that was about authority kind of viewing the queer, intersex or disabled body 
and the, that body being turned into an object with no power. Here, it's a little different because the vlogger is positioning themselves in the scene. They're writing the dialogue or script. Um, they, are, they are cutting the video um, together in, in whatever program they're using. So they're on both sides of the camera at once. And that's a really important thing to notice that makes vlogging um, different from, say, um, some of the more kind of abusive practices we've looked at um, in other aspects of this course. So they film themselves talking and performing, and then they post their entries on video content platforms like YouTube. YouTube is, is very searchable, so it tends to be um, the most common. Vimeo is also a place where people host video content like this. And I'm sure you've watched vlogs. If you follow any influencers, um, uh, you're definitely watching a, a new media form. Um, what, what qualities do vlogs have? They tend to be amateur. Um, I would say that <laughs> ContraPoints is an interesting example of somebody who has developed a really sophisticated approach to vlogging and her sets and characters are super complex and she didn't start out making things this complex. It's, it's been an evolving practice for her. Um, but she certainly isn't a professional film director um, or anything like that. She's, she's simply a person, right? Um, and the tone of vlogs is usually personal and confessional, so you feel like the vlogger is talking right to you, and that's really important. Um, uh, specifically because most m video news media is intentionally objective about LGBTQ subjects, right? Well, they'll, they'll present like a good side and a bad side and try to be balanced, right? And in this case, we get a super subjective take on trans experience that comes directly out of that person's um, first person account, right? So remember last week we talked about compulsory accounts and stories. Here we get an opportunity for the vlogger to push back against those compulsory accounts that are, are everywhere in our culture and give, give a more direct account that's not beholden to those dominant narratives. Vlogging um, is a new media format that was made possible by the development of open source digital video streaming technology, um, which has really only existed in a, in a widely usable format um, since about 2010, I would say. Maybe a little earlier, some people were doing this, but really YouTube uh, started to be capable of handling longer videos um, around that time. So it's really only existed for about a decade. Vlogging actually is not the first time that uh, trans and queer people have used new media platforms to do this kind of storytelling. So um, it has come along and replaced earlier forms like um, LiveJournal, which was like um, a sort of interactive blogging site where people were writing their stories and chatting. Um, so video just adds the aspect of being able to see the person, which I think is when we think about LGBTQ experiences, being able to see other queer and trans people in their immediate lives is like super transformative and really changes what kinds of stories we have access to and what kinds of bodies we can look at. Vlogging as a format is structured by the various host platforms that vloggers use. So depending on where people are posting content, um, you know, that's how long it can be, that's how sharp the image can be. Um, YouTube infamously started actually um, taking down all of its LGBTQ related uh, tags. Um, a lot, I think Instagram might have done this too. Um, and so uh, Tumblr definitely did. So um, it's not as easy to find content on YouTube as it used to be. And this was all done in the interest of like protecting children from seeing queer content, but it also has had the simultaneous effect of making this stuff easier to censor and um, restricting it and putting it behind um, barriers online. Um, content can either be open or private as well as for your paywall, right? So when you think about all the ways in which people are using these various technologies to create stories, share stories, make money from their stories. Um, it's an entire universe of storytelling that has really popped up online in the past decade. Now, what makes trans blogging unique? Um, and we could say uh, ContraPoints is like one of the most 
I think, ornate examples of trans blogging, but it but ContraPoints grows out of a deeper culture of trans blogging that has at least a 10 year history on YouTube and goes back much further in um, kind of like print form on LiveJournal and other spaces. So we can think about trans online culture as demonstrating how changes in gender identity and technology are, are intertwined. So, you know, um, a lot of trans people didn't even really realize they could transition until they started seeing images and videos from other trans people online saying, hey, you know, I decided to transition and he here's how I did it and here's my advice for accessing resources and here's where I, how I did my paperwork and here's, you know, where I found hormones or here's how I got a doctor to do this for me or that for me, right? So as these vlogs became more available, people started actually realizing like, hey, I could actually do that too. I think I maybe want to do this. And it seems like something that I could do and survive and live into um, in my own story because all these other people are doing it and I'm getting access to their stories, right? So we think about how media formats can actually change the way people live. They can actually activate new kinds of identities for people. And vlogging is definitely an example of that. Um, earlier trans internet cultures developed around these private blogging sites I mentioned like LiveJournal. And they were these closed spaces that where people would share hard to find information or offer each other support. They almost operated like pen pals, like super old school where you would like send letters back and forth, right? It was a way of building community because trans people are often so separated from one another, um, certainly more than even gay and lesbian people. So trans people were building these digital networks to circulate information that wasn't accessible anywhere else. But as vlogging developed and took over as a primary kind of transcultural formation um, in the last decade, what's really happened is that vlogging it's more immediate, right? Like you get to hear and see other trans people in this way that has never historically existed before. And that is super powerful for demonstrating that trans lives are livable, trans stories are stories that can be told. Um, and just, just the documentation of trans life online has become a super rich way of engaging with trans culture even if you're like super physically remote from say San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. Um, so not only do we get increased access to trans stories, but we also get, uh, the vloggers themselves get increased control over their own stories. So uh, remember with the medical gaze and the ways in which we've talked about looking at bodies um, and the way in which trans identities are stigmatized in US culture, um, uh, getting power to control how your own body and story are represented is can be super liberating. And so we see uh, trans creators using YouTube to actually seize control of how their bodies are represented, discussed, and labeled even, like what kinds of language get used. Um, we might even try, uh, try out a new name on YouTube, right, with like a, a community of people who are there to support you. Um, so representational control is really important to LGBTQ people and vlogging has provided one um, avenue for seizing that control. So what we see with vlogging is that it's one of these new media storytelling formats that trans people are using to express and integrate identities across medical transition. So the old model was like back in the 50s or 60s you would privately go to a doctor who would diagnose you as, you know, ill, mentally ill, right? Um, that would then set you up to be able to medically transition. But along with that, you had to agree to like quit your job, leave all your social contacts behind, move to a different city, start up an entirely new life. The whole idea as a trans person was that you had to kind of like leave your entire prior identity and life behind and assume it a totally new life with a, with a new persona. And this was like, as you can ima imagine, super difficult to, to undertake and, and medical doctors would actually like require you to do this. So 
being able to live in one consistent place with the same friends and family around you, the same community, and transition without having to do all of that kind of like um, leaving behind of former identity and like leaving behind your entire social network. Vlogging is one way of kind of tracking that process um, that allows trans people to, to integrate the experience of, of medical transition as it takes place, which is, which is a new kind of way that technology is allowing us to do this. So what we see with blogging is the way in which trans people are resisting dominant stories that get told about us. They are very nuanced responses to the dominant narratives trans people have to navigate. And you know, we've, t we've talked a bit about this in class, but what are some of the dominant stories that trans people are constantly having to confront? Um, you know, I always knew I was trans. Um, you know, I, I'm trapped in the wrong body. I, I, I can't survive without doing this. If I don't do this, I, I will die, right? All the ways in which cis people require us to, um, like basically <laughs> cis people like gatekeep the process of transition. And it's only if you're willing to tell certain stories about why you need that stuff that, that people give it to you. Um, there's also the like way in which um, those compulsory accounts get asked of us, like that we never bring up um, the person we were before, right? Or we don't force people to integrate those stories. So, or the fact that we still are diagnosed with gender dysphoria to get access to medical transition. And so we are, we're medically stigmatized and, and doctors expect us to tell certain stories about our feelings in order to get access to those, um, to like hormones and surgery. So vlogging gives us a space culturally to push back on a lot of those stories and narratives that get told about trans identity. How do they do this? <clears throat> they use um, realism and direct address to position trans subjects as actual people who are experts about their own experiences. And you can see this in ContraPoints where Natalie Wynn is like taking on the role of the medical authority and she's kind of satirizing and mocking the objective scientific view of her own body, right? By like holding up a skull and pointing at its different features. So there's a way in which um, trans people are allowed to be producers of knowledge about their own identities in a way that usually uh, doctors and politicians would, would actually have more control. Um, and certainly have a lot of control over our lives. So how does this provide us with a new space in which to, to um, perform our own expertise about our experiences? Um, they also use intimacy and immediacy. So this idea of immediate um, like distance from the person, the vlogger is always in the center of the camera, very close to the camera. We see and we can almost feel their presence and then also we feel like we're in this little inner circle of their world. Um, that's certainly true of, of ContraPoints where she talks to the audience as if they are her friends. Um, and this intimacy and immediacy, we can think of this as being a response to common depictions of trans people as objects. And also remember, we've studied the freak show a little bit, you know, the way in which um, queer, trans, intersex, and disabled people have been displayed as oddities for a kind of um, titillated audience. Here, instead, it's we can't objectify the vlogger because we are in their circle. They are in control of the story or narrative. And so that intimacy is built between us and that does not allow for the same level of, of objectification. They also, um, vlogs, promote a culture of affirmation for trans bodies and genders. Um, and this, is, this does not exist other places. There are, there are very few places you can go as a trans person in US culture to feel affirmed and validated um, and, and like desired, right? So, um, you know, we can see how Wynn is doing this 
uh, by pushing back on some of the more standard stigmatizing narratives of trans identity in this vlog, but also, you know, um, vlogs and, and also Instagram practices too, all over the internet that trans people engage in are about actually supporting and um, affirming one another because trans people don't get that um, from dominant culture. They also allow the vlogger to practice integrating a changing gender self-presentation. So it's not just that the vlogger is filming themselves for other people to watch. The vlogger is also filming themselves for them to watch, um, to actually start to see how one shows up on camera, how one is changing over the course of medical transition. And so vlogging is a way of actually kind of getting our arms around and re-witnessing and learning how we look and how we sound and how we're changing and trying to compress that into like a media format that lets us see and experience it. So I have an example of this actually um, from a vlogger who took one photo a day for five years. So this is pretty fascinating. Let's take a look. My internet crapped out. <laughs> Hang on. I'd really like to be able to see the end of this. Aww. Well, anyway, you get the idea. So what we saw in that video is an example of how vlogging can um, produce consistency across time, even as change is taking place. So I think it's really powerful that that vlogger um, positioned his eyes in the exact same position every time he took the photo so that you feel this consistency of his presence, even as his gender is shifting and his life is going by in the background, right? So, so often trans people are made to kind of cut our lives in half and not talk about before times. Um, and are prevented from really even, you know, the minute we say, oh, I'm a trans person and I had this whole other experience before this, we're kind of asked to throw those experiences away to be valid in our, in our transition genders. And that video really demonstrates how there's consistency uh, across these experiences and that it's an ongoing experience. It's, you never, you, you can't really say in that video when specifically transition is accomplished, right? It's more a flowing, ongoing experience that's, that the vlogger has pressed into a form so that, so that we can see what's actually happening. 
Um, and that's that's very different from the before and after photos that people are constantly searching online. And, and the, the dominant ways in which trans people are kind of represented as, as half people or as liars um, or as people with tragic secrets, right? That video is actually a pretty eloquent exploration of, of how gender transition can feel both fast and slow at the same time. Um, something else here um, is that these vlogs actually also give the vlogger control over time and editing of their own experiences. So this helps a person aesthetically navigate the gaps between, say, how one is feeling and how one is showing up. And I actually have a great example of this um, from a vlogger who's a dancer. And this is really actually quite long, so I'm going to click around in it a bit, but I want to show you how this person has actually documented their story by filming and refilming themselves dancing um, to track how their body is changing and is often often telling us uh, in the title cards like how they're feeling on the inside versus how their body is showing up on the outside. So I want to play a little bit of this for you. My internet is not happy today. I'm going to reload this. So already you can see that we're starting out in a place of childhood and we're moving into uh, puberty and adolescence. And then that's when the narrative starts to get more complicated as the person um, begins to film themselves uh, with themselves in the frame. There might be an ad, sorry. I have had, I've had this link open for like an hour or something. Sorry. I'm having all kinds of technological issues today. There we go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to move you up to uh, this middle period where we have, you know, really um, feminine dancing going on. Six years before coming out, he says. And this is the same person. Notice how the body is moving here. get into let's see here strong gender feels maybe I'm just still not trying hard enough me dot 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 Okay. 
you see how this person's look is changing? And now the self splits. We can see how the dancing style also starts to shift between masculine and feminine. And I'm gonna move us up to here. Okay, so we can see how this person is starting to integrate a masculine persona through um, dance comparisons, right? Where they are both offering their body for us to view, but they're also watching themselves. And this all leads to, and, and I want to note also that this is um, someone who had vlogged for like six, seven years, and this is the last vlog they posted before stopping vlogging. It's kind of like the last kind of attempt to tell us tell the story of how they transitioned through these kinds of dance comparisons um and you know they end the video with the same dance over again um which i want to show you right here sorry jane goodall <laughs> Internet is a weird place. Here we go. Four years in between. So um, what's really interesting in that last video is the vlogger says um, toward the end, you know, I know what comparison you're really here for, right? So he kind of withholds the very clear male and female comparison video for the end because he knows that a lot of people look at look for this kind of like before and after story that trans people are pressed into telling about ourselves. Like, look at how different I am now, right? But he withholds that and through the whole video he's actually problematizing that structure by showing how gradual it was and how much work goes into actually relearning how to move your body um re and like learning how to take a dance that he danced before transition and dance it through transition and then dance it after transition or like later in transition um and it all begins with this video of him as a little kid before gender has had gotten its claws into him just dancing because he loves dancing, right? Um, and and perhaps that's the most innocent state in the entire vlog, right? So that, that vlog is actually a super complex narrativization of the story of gender and gender transition um, in one person's life. Um, 
when we get to Win and the video I had you watch of hers, she's really pushing against these dominant norms of passability and respectability that trans people are also kind of pressured to uphold. Um, where she's like, you know, um, kind of pointing the finger back at us saying, you know, like, cis people expect me to be all these things, but really I'm just a person. And it's unfair of cis people to expect trans people to both pass and yet not pass, right? To both, um, you know, uphold cisgender standards of, of gender normativity, but then also have a radical politics of gender deconstruction and like being against the binary and all that. It's like an unsurvivable contradiction that trans people get placed in by these compulsory accounts that cis people require. So I wanted to just kind of put my finger down on a few things you actually said about this video because uh, people picked up on some some really great stuff about what Wynne is actually doing here with, with the way she's telling the story. Um, someone wrote, from the very start of the video, she starts an exaggerated and sarcastic commentary regarding her transgender journey that was a pointed reference to the ways that trans people, especially trans characters, uh, creators, and influencers, are expected to lay out every aspect of their lives and transition to the inquisitive eyes and ears of their cis viewers, right? Um, and so there's this moment where she starts saying, I've taken you all on my journey, and I've, I've always just been here to, in, in my transgender journey, and, and like all these voices start saying the word journey, 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 right? Which is um, a joke because is transition a journey? Do trans people go from one place to another? Do we end up somewhere else? Or are we just here ourselves the whole time? Um, and so the way that cis logics of storytelling have to tell a story about us going on a journey when really we're just going through a, a, like a da our daily lives and transition is happening, right? So this idea that we need to narrativize ourselves in specific ways is something that she's making fun of. And this, this commenter definitely picked up on that. They say also, she continues this attitude and joking manner throughout her video whenever she references the different stereotypes and compulsory narratives that are expected from trans people by society, specifically in, re in reference to beauty standards and passing, right? Um, also related to that, someone said, Natalie also discusses certain feminist groups insisting that she needs to fall in love with who she is as a trans woman without seeking surgery, right? So again, that's like a, like a double um, bind that trans people are placed in where you know, oh, if you were really, uh, you know, if you really loved yourself, you would accept yourself as you are and you wouldn't, you wouldn't need surgery, right? Um, meanwhile, like, what if getting surgery is actually an expression of self-love? Because a lot, some trans people feel that they really need surgery to fully inhabit their bodies. So um, it's kind of like this judgmental kind of phony feminist politics of saying well you shouldn't need to change your body you should just um, be radical and and oppose gender norms um someone else wrote natalie uses satire to talk about the ridiculous obsession that our culture has with being beautiful but pretending to not care and lashing out at others on social media she also uses the scenes where she dresses in victorian clothes and uses medical terminology to discuss facial surgeries to take a stab haha <laughs> stab at the medicalization of bodies and how trans people are required to have a medical reason to be able to undergo such surgeries while cis men are out there getting chin implants. Sorry, I don't even know what that is. Cis men are out there getting chin implants so they can get more women, right? So cis people are allowed to engage in all kinds of gender affirming um, practices, surgeries, are constantly doing gender affirming things like working out in certain ways or dressing themselves certain ways or wearing makeup certain ways or wearing your hair certain ways and that's fine but the minute a trans person tries to access those same things suddenly because it's not in alignment with the trans person's assigned sex suddenly it's a problem and there's all this stigma and medicalization that's involved so pointing up that contradiction is something that uh, ContraPoints is doing in this video she continues by joking and saying, ew, ew, because this simply brings on the idea that you have to settle on being kind or smart because society says that trans people cannot be seen as beautiful on the outside and for that reason they must be extra beautiful on the inside, right? And doesn't this get also to the idea that like the minute a trans person makes a mistake, like especially a public, like a famous trans person makes a mistake, there's like this huge pile on 
of people who are like, you're canceled, you're over. This has happened to Natalie, actually. Um, because we because we can never be accepted uh, for how we look, we have to be perfect on the inside. We have to have perfect politics and we have to say all the perfect things, right? So there are these like double standards that trans people get trapped in according to how we're expected to tell stories about our identity. Um, I think that society and cisgender people expect transgender people to share and document their journey in order for it to be valid, like they have something to prove. I think that a lot of us struggle with our appearance and the boxes we're supposed to be fitting into according to our gender and sexuality, right? Like cis people will validate trans people's identities by using our chosen names or using our pronouns. Um, and that's always conditioned on this idea that we share and make accessible to them our story or our journey, right? And, and tell it the right way and tell it in a not too confrontational or too complex way. And I think Wynne is definitely kind of pushing back on that expectation here. And lastly, someone wrote, she satirizes the compulsory account of her facial transition with scenes of her in Victorian clothing holding up the skull. She first begins by pointing out places on the skull where things get cut or altered, but her tone of voice isn't medical. She uses words like chiseled bone and stripped away skin. Her tone is very much mocking. Now doesn't this sound like something you'd want to do with your face? It addresses the necessity to explain oneself by giving a medical overview of what she had done, but she uses humor to distance herself from being a simple object of medical inquiry. That's a super great um, note here in the discussion blogs about how Wynne is occupying not only the role of the medical like person who's had the surgery, but also the person who's performed the surgery, right? So she takes on the voice of, of the medical authority as well, and she, she mocks um, that kind of di distanced, objective, elite kind of attitude that medical providers have um, taken on in relationship to trans people, trans and intersex people, um, throughout the last several centuries. Um, so all that is to say that that's a quick 101 on trans blogging and why trans people choose this format to tell stories um, because it has these uh, uh, formalist properties that allow us to push back on the way that our stories have been narrated by others, particularly the medical industry. Um, so I will leave it there. Uh, for our final course, we're going to be investigating two-spirit Native American identities and we're going to be reading some poetry. So again, another form. We've looked at a graphic illustration, we've looked at vlogging, and then we're gonna look at poetic form um, next week. So please do take a look at the, the reading on Native American sexualities because that's gonna be key to the background of what we're gonna be looking at. And then we are gonna be reading Crowley Driscoll's Walking with Ghosts, which is a collection of, of poetry about two-spirit experience. So I will leave it there and have a great evening.